Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Around the middle of every year, I start getting notes from editors telling me they're busy in early November. They have conflicts, they can't travel, there's a family thing, whatever. The reason is SEMA. The Specialty Equipment Market Association holds this annual trade show every year in early November in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it is a spectacle. Fortunately, MotorOne.com editor and video producer Clint Simone used to work for SEMA, and he loves attending the show. He's back with a first-hand report of the most popular cars at SEMA, and we've got another big debut that happened last week to talk about on this week's podcast. Joining me is the aforementioned Clint Simone. How are you doing, Clint? How are we doing, John? Pretty good. Very good, thanks. And also with us is senior editor Greg Fink. How are you, Greg? Great, John. How about you? Great. So let's get started. Let's talk about SEMA. And I mean, really, Clint, you're going to need to set the stage for us and the listeners because SEMA is unlike any event uh, in the automotive world. Give us a paint a picture in words for us of what SEMA is like. So this is my first time attending the show as just a member of the media. I'll save everybody from telling you what it's like working it as a staff member because you're probably not interested in those stories. Um, But as a member of a media or just attending in general, it's so you start with the fact that it's at the Las Vegas Convention Center, which as a venue hosts CES, it hosts other huge, huge shows throughout the year. And there's no way to really talk about the scale in like adequate terms. It's all-encompassing. It is absolutely massive. The outside of the SEMA show, before you even technically enter the show, is enough things going on to cover in one day. You really need three days to cover the show properly. Right. There's like, the convention center is multiple buildings, and plus every square inch of concrete outside the convention center is filled with cars uh, as well. So it has it spills out into the city. If I, if I had to pick one, yeah, the, the size of it is one thing, but if I had to boil down SEMA into one sentence and say why it is so special and there's nothing else like it during the calendar year, it is you'll see an import tuner car next to a lifted Jeep, next to a classic hot rod, uh, next to something that represents the future. Like, it really takes all spaces, all corners of the automotive world and blends it into one experience. And you see things that are parked next to each other that you just know you'll never see those cars in that order again the rest of the year. And it's it's also the the mingling of, I think, small and medium-sized companies with the really big automakers because the automakers show up to SEMA as well and they they bring their own project cars that they've spent months working on and those are right next to you know a small company from Nevada who has you know done some amazing work on a car so I really like the scale of of kind of um, companies who are doing their thing there and, and working together too. Yeah, that's exactly right. You have the aftermarket companies that everybody knows about, like Edelbrock, you know, those names that are just about as much of a name brand as the car manufacturers themselves. And then you have uh, smaller companies that are just starting to make their way and they have the chance to show off their products as well. But from the automaker side, they're putting specialty versions of the cars that we see year round. And sometimes you think they're hesitant to do that because it's including products that they themselves don't always manufacture. Um, But once specific automakers make the decision to go to SEMA, they kind of embrace that. They'll give out cars to some of the best builders in the country, and you'll end up seeing something like a Honda Civic or a Hyundai Veloster that looks just completely different than any of the stock cars. I can't remember. Aren't those called, uh, aren't they called dollar cars? Because um, basically every year companies will um, kind of petition the automaker for, to, to get a car. Uh, that they can work on as a project vehicle and then show together at SEMA. And they're usually called dollar cars because there'll be some transaction in order to pass the car from the automaker to the aftermarket company, and it's like a dollar. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that all gets into taxes and boring things, but that, that's right. They give out project vehicles. The credit words do. Ford kind of plays ball the best out of all of them. Ford will have between you know 30 and 50 vehicles in their booth. So you have everything from Expeditions, F-150s, Mustangs. I mean, it's across the board. They do a good job. Then others like Honda, Toyota, they embrace it as well. And and they also like it's not only um, the automakers working with third party uh, aftermarket companies, but the automakers themselves have their own accessories, right? So like Mopar is huge at at SEMA. They have their own cars. They're they're 
pimping every um, every accessory that you can buy for Jeeps and things like that. Uh, but every company like, you know, Ford Performance and they all have their accessory brands that are, um, you know, showing what they offer and showing what the cars look like when you load them up with every single accessory that the automaker sells. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's certain automakers play ball better than others. You, I mean, maybe some very small presence, but largely the German automakers don't play ball at all. Um, their cars tend to not be at SEMA in an official capacity, but then you have others, like I just mentioned, some of the Japanese companies, uh, Hyundai starting to play ball a little bit mm-hmm. better than, of course, the Americans like Ford and FCA. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, you've been to way more SEMA shows than I have. I've been to like maybe five and I haven't been in a long time. What I remember attending as part of the media was it's, it's, it's almost impossible to cover because it's so large and there are so many things that it be, it's a game to find the diamond in the rough. It's a game. You're looking for the one car that you're, you know, that our competitors haven't noticed yet or found, uh, and report on it. Uh, to be the first to find like that one crazy car at uh, at SEMA. I remember one year we found the world's ugliest Mustang and it turned out to be like one of the most popular articles we had ever written because this Mustang was just so atrocious. Um, and you, that's what you'll find that there. You'll find the <laughs> the ugliest cars you've ever seen. You'll find the most beautiful cars you've ever seen and everything in between. Uh, but let's let's talk about um, the kings, uh, the cars that were king of, of SEMA this year. And there were a few. Um, I want to the, the one that surprised me the most uh, that I had no idea was coming was the Ford Mustang Lithium. Greg, why don't you give us the rundown on what was special about this Mustang? Yeah, I was surprised by it, too. And unlike you guys, I've never been to SEMA. So one of these days I might have to make that trek. But Then I hear horror stories of how big it is, and maybe it's better (laughs) I don't go. But this thing really did impress me. It's an electric Mustang with 900 horsepower and 1,000 pound-feet of torque. And beyond that, it's got a six-speed manual still. So I don't really know how that works. I mean, obviously, you can shift gears with an electric motor, but you have so much torque down low, there's usually not a need to. So I guess it's just there for fun times yeah. and they really they didn't give us much information about it and like we don't know how large the battery pack is we don't know what the range is they did tell us it has an 800 volt architecture which and i you know i'm not an electrician or an electrical engineer uh but that supposedly lets uh the car use more of the power with less heat um which is great and if, you know i was surprised by this in the sense that I know Ford is moving towards electrification in a big way. They have plans to turn pretty much every car they sell into either um, a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or a full electric um, in the next three to five years. But to to do that and to play with the Mustang brand um, in that way is always a risky thing because Mustang fans are the the most diehard, the most opinionated. Um, they're going to have uh, an opinion to say about anything you do with a Mustang, especially when you're tinkering with, I mean, the heart of the car, the engine, the V8, you know, uh, it was enough that we had a, a four cylinder Mustang come out in the last few years. And now th- to bring out an electric Mustang has to be a, sh- a shock, no pun intended to the system uh, of these fans. But here we are um, with this incredibly powerful car. I think that's what Ford's hoping is that just the power numbers alone would help, um, soften that transition, um, for Mustang fanatics. Well, and I think they're probably thinking, let's start to get them ready for this idea of their Mustang inspired electric crossover they have coming. So the Mustang inspiration seems less of like, Hey, they're not supposed to be electric to like, Oh yeah, they did make that electric concept car at SEMA. So I guess we're used to that. Yeah, that's, this car kind of sets the table for that whenever it does happen, which is some point soon. But the part that Ford probably won't put on the record is that Chevy last year had an all-electric version of the Camaro that kind of stole the show. So I'm sure people internally at Ford are like, all right, hold my beer, let's see what we can do. Um, and they come out with this Mustang this year. So part of that is likely in response to the positive reception that that Camaro had last year at SEMA. But absolutely, this car has to set the table uh, for Ford in the future, and specifically Ford performance. I mean, there's a difference between having a more utilitarian vehicle be electric, but to have a performance car be all electric, that sort of makes people think a little harder. You know, I've been saying this in lots of different ways when when I get into conversations about electrification in the auto industry. And I think you're exactly right, Clint, because I think Ford 
really studied the market and studied electric vehicles that, that have come out in the last three years. And they have learned that um, if you want success on the level of Tesla, you can't just take a car and make it electric. You have to have some type of passion and emotion involved for people to get excited about it and, and glom onto it. Um, that's what Tesla has manufactured with its cars really well. Um, that I don't think you know brands like Audi or, or Jaguar have with the e-tron or the iPace or even Chevy with the Bolt. There's no excitement there. There's no passion. Uh, there's no emotion created by those vehicles. And I think Ford is looking at the Mustang as the the tip of the spear for its electric electrification effort. They're going to get people excited about what they're doing with electric cars by letting the Mustang lead the way, not only with this concept, but also with the Mustang inspired EV crossover and things like that. So I think it's incredibly smart. Um, I think they have the best chance to have a breakthrough where all of these other manufacturers who launch these electric cars and then only wind up selling, you know, 200 a month, uh, where, you know, Tesla's selling 20,000 Model 3s a month. I think Ford has has a chance to break that cycle and maybe break through with a, an EV that's more exciting. But like I said, I mean, we know we know people who are in the Mustang community and it is a risky thing to tinker uh, with that that brand, that Mustang brand. So we will see what happens. The The Mustang EV crossover is scheduled to debut in a couple weeks, uh, right before the LA Auto Show. And we'll, of course, be there for that. That's going to be super exciting. Um, and and yeah, I think, like I said, we're, Ford has the best shot at, at really breaking through um, using the Mustang. But it's also risking pissing off a lot of people, too. Um, I also wanted to bring up that in addition to that, electric Camaro from last year's SEMA, there's there's a, a third-party company called, Geno, I think it's Genovation, uh, that has made an electric Corvette. Uh, it's a C7 Corvette, uh, but it's been breaking records with it. And I think it currently has the world record for the highest top speed of, a, of an electric car, of a road, I think a road-going electric car. Um, and it's hit 210 miles per hour. Uh, although uh, the company says that it can theoretically do 220. And I bring that up because its power levels are very similar to the power levels of the Ford Mustang Lithium. If we want an idea of what kind of performance um, we could expect from a, a fully electric Mustang like that. Uh, but man, imagine, I, I think it's safe to say that Ford is definitely thinking of producing a production fully electric Mustang with how much power you can get out of electric, uh, power trains, that thing is going to be insane. I mean, I don't think the production car is going to have a manual transmission. That's just speculation. But the, the car in the SEMA booth had a functioning manual transmission, even though it was an electric Mustang. The thought of that to me is very cool. I have no idea how yeah. it plays out in actuality, but wow, that's weird. I, I Again, I think that's a way to increase the emotional connection with the car because that's one aspect of driving EVs that has been lost to date is any type of transmission or feeling connected with the car. For Ford to reintroduce that, I think, would be a feather in their cap um, and draw people to something like an electric Mustang with a manual transmission. I don't know. Remember Tesla first tried to do a manual transmission with the Roadster? I think it was just even a two-speed transmission, and those broke all the time. I don't think electric... I mean, I'm not an engineer. Maybe times have changed. It's been more than a decade. But I think electric doesn't play very well with gear, a lot of gears. Because it seems of how like you can break it pretty dang quickly. I think, yeah, I, with, the, with the Tesla, I don't think we can say whether the fact that those transmissions didn't work well was the concept of a manual transmission uh, with an electric car or just, you know, Tesla at the time was super young and didn't know what they were doing. You know, it could have just come down to they made a bad decision and they didn't have great engineering at the time. So, um, I mean, Ford has done it, but like I said, they've released very little information about the car. We haven't even seen it move, uh, let alone, uh, you know, really show what it can do. Hopefully they will um, show us that or allow us to drive it um, so we can get a chance to, to see what that experience is like, a manual transmission with an electric car. Um, it's interesting, though, in our coverage of SEMA, um, as cool as an all-electric Mustang is, it was not uh, the most popular car that we wrote about. Um, that distinction goes to a Dodge Charger 
uh, that was built by Speedcore. Um, and if anybody remembers uh, Speedcore, they're a company that basically can take any car and, and if you want, produce the entire body in carbon fiber. So they created a fully carbon fiber Dodge Charger uh, wide body, and they made it all wheel drive. They uh, twin turboed the engine and it produces 15, over 1500 horsepower, 1525 to be exact. Um, you, you guys did a video of this car at the show, Clint. Uh, so you, you saw it in person and got to walk around it. What was it like in person? <laughs> yeah, it was surrounded by people is what it was like. And there's a reason for it. Speedcore. I love these guys. The last couple of years, they've done Dodge Demons. They've done other performance vehicles. And they have this mantra of just cars that are already exceptionally fast and still finding some need to make them go faster, even though nobody's asking them to. So in this case, they took a Dodge Charger Hellcat wide body, a car that nobody's asking for more power, and they cranked it up to 1,525 horsepower. They yanked uh, out the supercharger that comes with that 6.2 liter V8, and they put two massive turbochargers in its place. And crucially, they made the car all-wheel drive. So when you're up close next to the car in person, the, the front tires are enormous. I mean, it just looks alien compared yeah, to Yeah, it looks it really weird. Yeah, it looks super weird. I, their side exit exhaust as well, which just makes it that much cooler. But we have to reserve final coolness judgment until we see it on a drag strip and actually make it down the drag strip without braking. But I have high hopes. They, they seem to have really high quality products. Uh, the car was in the Magnaflow booth, so Magnaflow worked on the car as well as HP tuners, so they're very reputable names. Um, and you have to love that. It's an alternative on an already high-horsepower high car, and it's sort of at the core of what SEMA is all about. Yeah, I read that they um, they were given um, a Dodge Charger wide body uh, by, Do by Dodge, and they, they had to take each body panel and take it off so that they could put it in a mold and create a new cast to create identical carbon fiber uh, body panels, which just, that sounds so cool. I'd love to watch a video on that process. They throw it all into CAD. The only parts of the car that are not carbon fiber is like the main frame, so to speak. But the front fenders, the, the rear area of the car, the trunk lid, the hood, the rocker panels, the fender flares themselves, every major panel of the car is carbon fiber. I had read that this car started as a police vehicle. It was a pursuit model that they got a demon, um, I guess, crate engine and stuffed it in and did all that. That's even stuff. better. Well, yeah. that's, that's an even better story. Yeah, I don't know what spaceships they're pursuing or why you need that amount of power, but I like the story either way. Yeah, exactly. I think they have the the record for the, the fastest demon as well with the, the demon they made uh, for SEMA last year. Um, very cool. It was just, to me, this was you know, the exact kind of vehicle I like seeing at SEMA, um, just totally overboard, but not, not silly, you know, like, man, this is, this is a car, like I would have built in a video game, uh, that's come to life. And that, that to me, that's what SEMA is for. Let's um, race it against that Mustang. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. The other vehicle that I think deserves an honorable mention just for the sheer, um, headspace it occupied at SEMA is the new Supra. So this was the this is basically the Supra's first SEMA, right? Yeah, that's right. The timing of it, uh, it debuted in Detroit of last year, so it didn't have a chance and missed it by a couple of months. But but perfect kind of timing, wondering... like long, you know, that's like an you know what a ten month lead time to yep. for everybody to build their SEMA project cars. Yeah, to get a hold of a car to begin with and then start building it. Um, I've kind of been wondering the last couple of weeks, people are checking in just on social media. Hey, how many Toyota Supras is Toyota actually selling? Because they've been somewhat quiet about it. Um, somebody's buying them because they were all at SEMA. <laughs> there were, I think somebody did a count. There were nearly 50 of them on the show floor. Um, my biggest takeaway from this, and I spoke with a lot of people about this as we saw a bunch of these different cars, everything from very, very slightly modified all the way to the crazy slammed wings on the back, wide body examples of it. And the regular design is so perfect for modifying just slightly. If you lower it a little bit, if you widen it a little bit, and then best of all, if you add some extra front splitter to the car, it just looks so good. 
it was a perfect canvas and a lot of people went the tasteful route instead of the just crazy over the top. I was so excited to see these examples because they look fantastic. And I think if people lightly modify them, especially as we get into the next 10, 15 years, they're going to look great in the future as well. It was really cool to see. Yeah, one thing I saw that I really liked was somebody had made like a spoiler to mimic the exact one on the Mark IV Supra. Um, that big, you know, the kind of big rear spoiler. And it was like exactly the same shape as that, which I think is funny because it seems like there's a, <laughs> that's like the most loved Supra of all time, the Mark IV. Um, and I feel like there's been a lot of effort in the aftermarket community to try to turn this new Supra into that one. <laughs> so it's people with body kits that, that just try to evoke that, that uh, earlier design more. Um, Toyota even right. made one with that Supra Heritage Edition, which was, I thought, awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was a car that Toyota made internally. Um, Toyota themselves had the most Supras in their booth. In fact, the entire booth was Supras, save for an Avalon TRD shoved in the corner, weird enough. Um, but they had all these different examples of Supras, again, sort of running the gamut from very, very slightly modified to some extreme examples. Uh, as well but yeah that heritage car was one of the the super examples in the toyota booth and it, huge crowds around it all day it looks sweet yeah i hope they make that into a package or something something like that they have to so you know i think another good um a good thing that sema provides is like a window into the trends that are happening um, not only, I, I think it's both like the trends that are currently going on. And also you can kind of, if you look really closely, see a peek at future trends. Um, let me ask you, Clint, since you were on the floor and you kind of, you know, had your eyes on a swivel the whole time, what trends did you see in terms of cars, uh, you know, which were the most popular, what people were doing to them? Uh, well, we've already spoken about it at length, but we're starting to sneak electrification into these examples in, in some way or another. There's always this sort of unspoken about, um, uh, not rivalry, but you have this dichotomy between CES and SEMA. And sometimes the two don't play well together where CES is supposed to be the gateway to the future of automotive. But this year I was actually happy to see that some of those future embodying vehicles were at SEMA. They didn't save it all for CES. Um, definitely electrification, just in terms I, of... W- yeah, one thing ahead, I saw in terms of electrification um, was the advent of um, electric crate engines. So basically, these are like like modules. Like I think Chevy had one in, in their SEMA truck concept that basically can take the place of a V8 um, in in a classic car or a truck or something like that. Uh, I'm really interested in that in the future where, you know, it gets easier and people figure out more and more ways where you can do electric conversions with any car, whether it be a late model car or a 30, 40, 50 year old car. Um, that really excites me. And I think we're starting to see that with the advent of these electric crate engines. Yeah, I mean, a lot of SEMA traces its roots back to, like I said earlier, Edelbrock, companies like that, high horsepower, big V8s, and all of the aftermarket componentry that you needed to modify those engines, improve them, keep them alive. So with all that, like old school, just muscle and performance to see electrification sneak its way into that show is sort of indicative of people embracing it to some extent. I'll also say that it's not going to be you know, not everybody's going to look at that Mustang lithium and be immediately excited. You're going to have a lot of people lamenting, you know, the death of the Mustang and this and that. But it's it's cool to see those two merge together. Yeah, for sure. Um, what about what about the Civic? Because that's a car that I feel like had its heyday at SEMA in you know the beginning of the. Um, Fast and Furious era, you know, that was like the the go-to tuner car uh, of its era because it was cheap and, and you can modify it, you can make it fast. Um, is that, does that still have a good show at SEMA or is it kind of fading away? Yeah, the Fast and the Furious type cars, you have things people love like Mitsubishi Evo, but that car is taken away from us now. The WRX is still around, but it's sort of at the end of its life and people are really clamoring for a new one they're excited about that so that car is in a bit of a lull in terms of aftermarket 
right now. But yeah, Civic Type R, that comes out not too far back, and then it, it reignites everybody who loves Honda. That car comes to the United States, and then people went crazy with it, especially at last year's show. But that trend was still very much present this year. I feel like that extra year also gave aftermarket tuners a chance to really dial in their technology as well. And that will be the case for Supra in years to come, probably more powertrain modifications. Um, as opposed to just aesthetic ones. But yeah, Civic Type R was all over the place and this was a really good year for it. Some really nice examples. You know, another trend that I see um, as I'm kind of um, getting bombarded with press releases from companies who are debuting things at SEMA is the the rise and the increase in off-road products um, and also overlanding, um, which we've been covering a lot on Motor One. Um, you know, overlanding has actually its its own trade shows. Um, I, what are they called? Overland, Overland Expo. And there's two of them, Overland Expo East and Overland Expo West. So we've been covering those this past year. But at SEMA, I noticed uh, both OEMs, you know, they would have their, they, they, you know, however many cars that the automaker brings, they would have um, half that were... Um, that were performance oriented and then like half that were overlanding oriented. So like, you know, Honda had an overlanding version of the passport, um, CRVs as well. CRVs. Yeah. CRVs were sort of the big ones that they were about. They had a, the new hybrid, they had a sort of a barely modified version of that. Then they went crazy with the gas powered version that was overlanded out. That one's also, uh, we shot a video on that. So check out the motor one us YouTube channel to see coverage of that car. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, the Gladiator was huge. There were tons of off-road and overlanding um, examples of that there. Um, and then I, there's actually even companies that specially build uh, overlanding RVs. Um, I can think of two of them off the top of my head. One is Earth Cruiser that has an amazing uh, overlanding. Uh, they, they they call it an expedition vehicle because it really is something you could like drive up to the Arctic Circle and and live in. Uh, and then Earth Roamer is another one. They're the ones that are kind of famous for, they have an F650 based uh, RV, uh, off-road RV that's like $1.7 million. And I think, and they were at SEMA as well. Um, but my favorite is, and we've had this two years in a row, two years in a row, there have been a company. I don't think they're the same company. Uh, it's been two different ones, but they've taken like an old motorhome and really done it SEMA style, not off-road, but more on-road kind of performance they slam it they give it an amazing paint job totally custom interior last year it was an old um i think it was a chevy motorhome and it was done up in a green and white scheme this year it was one and it has a the the greatest name it was called brown sugar Uh, i don't know if you guys saw it but it was totally slammed had a great brown color scheme and orange and red uh i love that stuff um so yeah you can see anything at sema it's really it, it, it is an amazing show. I think in our community of journalists, it gets a bad rap because of just how crazy it is. But Greg, I would highly recommend next year you raise your hand and, and go with Clint and, and check it out. It is uh, it, at least to do it once. It, it's it's unlike any anything we cover. Um, even, you know, it's on the level of CES, but it's it's way it's it's obviously 100 percent car oriented where CES is only like 10 percent car oriented. So to me, it's way more fun than CES. Only if Clint agrees to be the on-camera person the whole time. <laughs> yes, I think I think he would agree to that. Um, so there was there was also something that happened in Las Vegas right before SEMA that uh, wasn't a car at the show, but Ford used the opportunity I think for having everyone in town to invite journalists um, for a surprise, and we were in attendance. Um, and the surprise was the debut of the Ford Bronco R. So this is like a super early sneak peek at the production Ford Bronco that will be returning to showrooms uh, in a year or so. Uh, we know that the production version isn't going to debut until spring of next year, spring 2020. But they debuted the Bronco R. And man, this is like pulling the, the covers off of the production body because it's not it's not it doesn't look like a production car it looks like a Baja racer but still you you're seeing body panels um, that should be recreated on the production version um, and the and, underpinnings are the same it's the t6 platform that's going to be used by the production Bronco so we know now it's going to have independent front suspension you know live rear axle. And supposedly this EcoBoost engine, which I've heard is a V6, they don't outline it in their, you know, in their uh, press release. 
but everyone I've read who was there and talked to said it was a, it's a V6. I think it's the 2.7, might be the 3.5. They said that engine is obviously modified, but it's based off the engine that's based on the production, production one. Yeah. Uh, our, our man there, uh, Gabriel Vega, he got to go for a ride and he took video and it sounds awesome. Um, and Ford is doing this with, uh, I think, a purpose too. They want to race it, right? My understanding is, yes, the number is 2069 because 20 represent the, represents the class it's going to compete in at the Baja 1069. I think it's they just want to have 69 on the car, but they say it's to me- commemorate 1969 when 50 years ago a Ford Bronco won the Baja 1000, something they claim has not been duplicated by a 4x4 in 50 years. I'm not a big Baja 1000 guy, so I don't know if that's where the facts are in that. Clearly, it did something that was very important, has not been replicated. I don't know if usually these trucks are rear drive or they're like, oh, no, because it's production based or SUV. And a lot of times they use truck bodies. But 50 years ago, a Bronco did something that was very important. And this commemorates it. (laughs) So it'll be competing in the Baja 1000. One thing I saw on Facebook, uh, James Glickenhaus, who um, is, uh, you know, the owner and founder of uh, SCG, um, which makes, you know, uh, supercars and races, you know, in a lot of different race series. He's bringing back the the boot, which is an off-roader from way back in the day as well. Um, and he's making a modern version of it. Version of it. He's going to race that in the Baja 1000 as well. And he pointed out on Facebook that um, he's going to sell his for uh, a street legal version of his that's identical to the race version. Um, so he was kind of taking a dig at Ford that they had to make a special version of theirs just to race. Um, so it'll be, I, I, I'm not a huge Baja 1000 watcher as well. I mean, I, I kind of look at the results when they're done, but uh, this um, this coming race seems like it'll be pretty cool with the return of both of these vehicles um, racing for the first time in a long time. All right, um, so let's uh, let's keep moving. Um, we had a, a good amount of reader feedback, or not reader feedback, listener feedback from last week. Uh, last week's episode, you guys weren't on, but we did a lot of uh, talking about uh, the Koreans and how good they've been doing at car design um, in the past, you know, 10, 20 years. It's just how they've really cranked up the dial. Um, so we had a few uh, commenters um, put in their two cents. I want to read a couple. The first one is from a listener named Blah. Uh, great name. Um, he says, I absolutely love the Koreans and what they are doing for the car world. Every segment they enter, not only do they push boundaries, but they raise the bar. Just look at the Telluride Palisade or the Kia Stinger. They take the risks everyone else is too afraid to take. I love them for it. Good or bad, you can't say they aren't trying. And then he goes on to say, John, I fully agree with you on the A7 and its new design. Not as good as the first gen. Same thing for the CLS, in my opinion. So there's two things to unpack there. One, he Agrees, you know, and I think um, all of us on the podcast la- last week agreed that you know the Koreans just are are, are killing it. Um, but um, I also kind of took a shot at the A7 because that's what I drove last week um, in terms of design because I think that's a car where uh, the first generation of the A7 was great, and in the la- in the subsequent generation, it's kind of taken a step back and lost a little of the styling magic it had in the first one. Um, now, let me read another comment, though, because this guy disagrees. Uh, his name's Mike, and he says, uh, design perhaps, but the Koreans usually copy someone else and they lack resale, reliab- reliability, and too many recalls. Uh, and I, you know, they, it's fine to have your opinion on the design, but I don't think there's any a- actual evidence that, that they are way worse in terms of resale or reliability or recalls. And as a matter of fact, with their, you know, 10 year powertrain warranty, they have to be reliable or Hyundai and Kia go bankrupt trying to fix all their cars. So, um, I don't really agree with that. What do you guys think though? Um, Clint, let me start with you. Uh, Korean design, yay or nay, are they killing it or not? There's a lot to go on with those two comments, for sure. Uh, Recalls are a case-by-case basis, so I'm certainly not going to speak to that. Uh, I am in the camp with Team Blah and Team John on A7 and CLS not being as good as the first gen, though I... Uh, the the Koreans killing it with design is also very specific to cars for me. I love, 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 love the Kia Telluride. It's probably my favorite car of the year just across the board. I love the Stinger and I love the new Veloster. I think the new Sonata and the Genesis G90 look absolutely terrible. So there are some cases where they're just getting too weird. We're about to see 
excuse me, the new Optima coming out soon as well, and that thing looks funky as hell. I am not into what I've seen thus far through renderings. Um, so I think they're pushing things a little too far wow. in some cases, and then in cases like the Telluride, they absolutely hit it out of the park. Yeah, I think you're in the minority uh, on the Sonata and the Optima. Um, we'll see when the Optima debuts. But Tell so, me I'm wrong, Greg. Yeah, what do you think, Greg? I like what they're doing. I mean, I, I'm not going to say the Sonata is the best-looking car in the segment. I still think the Mazda 6 just has a very like slinky sex appeal. But Hyundai's not making ugly cars or Kia, and they're pushing boundaries, and I really like that. And even the G90, which is definitely a different look, it's got a very confident look. It's you know, it's not ripping anybody else off. It's very much its own thing. I think, I think the Koreans are just doing a really good job with design, even if it's not necessarily the best looking in the segment. They're not ugly, and they're definitely original. The I also think- say it is ugly. I also and original. Genesis is still a young brand, and I, I kind of feel like they are still searching for a brand identity when it comes to design. I think they 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 have one now that is permeated through all the vehicles. I just don't know that it's the right one. I don't know that it's either distinctive enough or emotional enough. Um, so I'm, but I'm I'm curious to see when they come out with their uh, SUV. Um, how that moves it forward. Um, the G90 is, you know, definitely a love it or hate it. Um, and so is the Sonata, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? Love it or hate it? I, man, I, I, it I think like the Sonata fish. looks gorgeous. Oof, yeah, I, I kind of feel that. it's a love it or like it. It's like, I mean, I'm sure some people will hate it, but yeah, to I don't, me, I don't th- it'd be hard to call it ugly. Yeah, I just don't think it's, uh, and obviously tastes are personal, so not hating on anybody who finds it ugly, but I think if you were to poll 100 people, the majority of them would be a difference between I like it or I love it and not a lot of I hate it. I might fight you on that a little bit, but we can do this in a way that makes sense. Let's put a poll on the side or something. I think something like an Accord that would, would be, a be good love it or like it. Oh, see, I agree. I think the Accord is more love it or hate it. I think there, there are people out there who genuinely hate the Accords. Uh, this is why design. none of us are designers. Yeah. I, I wanted to be when I was a kid, but damn art, art teacher in high school uh, didn't pay enough attention to me. So here I am writing about cars. All right. There's uh, one more uh, good comment that we got on last week's episode. This one's from Vlad, and it was regarding our discussion of American pickups in Europe uh, based on the news that FCA and PSA are merging and that, you know, suddenly Ram pickup trucks could show up in Europe uh, in in, uh, a lot higher numbers. Um, He says, I believe there's a decent fan base and people like them in Europe, especially because of V8 engines. Oh, my God, that sound. Obviously, I can't and won't speak for the entirety of Europe, but some cities here are not ideal for cars that size, especially older cities and not to mention fuel consumption. I think that that's a fantastic point uh, of why it's a it's a little strange that, you know, if if PSA wanted to do this merger um, to get at Jeep and Ram, it seems like Jeep is the much more valuable um brand for them to bring over to europe and and spread more widely even though you can get jeeps in lots of places already just the ram is just uh you know a truck that big and there is no mid-size um ram pickup yet uh even though there's rumors there might be so i agree like unless you're out in the country um you know if you're in an older city in europe there's not many places a ram can fit and when you go to fill it up it's gonna kill your wallet over there with fuel prices yeah, but if Ram, the brand, I don't know what the brand value is like in Europe, but if the brand value is solid, they can do what Ram did in Mexico, where they just took the Mitsubishi little pickup truck and called it a Ram, I think it's 1200 So if you put the badge on something, you can probably cash in on the value if there's enough value. Well, we know the... Made. We know the Jeep and the Wrangler brand are hugely valuable uh, uh, globally, uh, including in Europe. And I think there's a... If, if you want to offer something that has that kind of wholesome Americana um, image. I think Ram does that as well as, as Jeep. Like it's the, they're the things that people like, like about America and not don't hate. It's like these kind of uh, brand images. Um, So yeah, they could do that. They could find a smaller pickup from somewhere else and just badge it a Dodge uh, or a Ram. Um, Did you guys see um, in the chat room this week that um, picture of a Dodge Ram 6,500 truck uh that i put in the group you guys were you guys both might have been traveling i found a picture 
Uh, it basically, Ram doesn't make a 6,500 truck. They they make up to a 5,500 heavy duty truck, which itself is huge. But when you go from 5,500 to 6,500, it's like it's like a whole class size difference. Um, and the 6,500 trucks are like when you look at the 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 F series, the um, 6,500 over there. That's the one that is just gig- ginormous. And I think the Kodiak on the GM side is the one that's a 6,500. Um, since, since Dodge and Ram never made one, they made one in Mexico. That is the funniest looking, uh, product with a crosshair, crosshair grill I've ever seen. It is the largest Dodge Ram you've ever seen, but it uses like the Ram from four generations ago. Um, look it up online, Mexico Dodge Ram 6,500, and you'll have a chuckle. I Remember swear. Mexico also got that cool, like the more modern, I don't know if they called it Ram charger or not, but it was like from the 94 to 2001 Ram that they made into like a little three door Ram charger, you know, sequel, like a three door Tahoe competitor. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff, uh, down in Mexico and South America that they get to do with our vehicles, uh, that never made their way up here. Uh, I actually, I actually follow a few Mexican, uh, car dealerships on Facebook because they find such cool stuff. Uh, and, and I always want to keep my eye on it. I don't even know how I would get it over here or if I could even do that legally, but I just love seeing the weird stuff they have down there. So we'd love to hear what you think about uh, this episode of the podcast. Please leave a comment on MotorOne.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, where the discussion will continue. Coming up, we're going to find out what we've all been driving this week. But before the break, I want to remind you that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you should be able to find it. So please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. Uh, Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Greg. Uh, What have you been driving? Well, I've been out driving a car that I can't speak about yet this week. But the week before, I was driving the latest 2020, which is actually like eight years old, but 2020 Toyota Sienna SE Premium. So it's the sporty premium one of the Sienna. it's the sporty swagger wagon. Right? Yeah, and I mean the car's feel or the van is feeling its age. It's been around since yeah. like 2011 or 12 at this point. And yeah, we've gotten a new um, Chrysler Pacifica. We've gotten a new Honda Odyssey. Like this mm-hmm. is the old man uh, on stage, just like with a bunch of young guys. Yeah, short of the Grand Caravan, which for some reason Dodge and Chrysler and FCA keep churning out. Oh, this they is, still sell tons of those. It's because yeah. it's because it's cheaper. It's the cheapest minivan you can buy. Uh, the it's Sienna, like the though, is Frontier effect. Yeah, anyway, yeah. The the Sienna is both old and as expensive as the other new minivans. So I don't know. It's a tough for me. It's a tough sell for Toyota to. Oh, it's pretty to pricey. It. it starts at like thirty one and some change, but it is the only minivan that does come standard with like the major safety features you look for that are advanced. You know, adaptive cruise. Lane departure warning, you know, all that stuff. I'm not sure for some people that's worth spending over $30,000 to get to an entry-level minivan, but it's definitely worth something for people who are especially carrying kids and you want to make sure they're safe. For sure, yeah. I also know that um, the the Sienna is the only minivan that offers all-wheel drive, so that's a nice... um, Nice thing it's got going for it for people who live in colder climates and things like that. Now, I don't want to make it seem like you have to have all-wheel drive in colder climates. You absolutely don't, especially in large, heavy vehicles uh, that have front-wheel drive. Um, And if you buy a set of snow tires, you're totally fine. But... You know, it is a nice selling point at the, you know, for salespeople at the dealer when you're trying to get somebody to buy your eight year old minivan. Also, I haven't driven one in a while, although even if it's been four years, this probably drives similarly to what (laughs) the one you drove. Uh, But I have driven the Pacifica and the Odyssey, and those both drive incredibly well for what they are. Um, How does the Sienna drive still? Like I said, it wasn't that great of an experience last time I tried. I mean, it doesn't drive poorly, but it doesn't drive particularly well either. The, you know, the chassis feels a little old, especially when you drive a Pacifica. Or now they have the Voyager, which is just the entry-level Pacifica. You know, that that van just feels so modern and just really good in every way. And the Sienna doesn't feel bad, but there's nothing you'd really call out and be like, that's fantastic. Yeah, to me, the other the the Pacifica and the Odyssey, they really drive like cars, which is actually an incredible feat for being as large and heavy and tall as they are. 
And I remember the Sienna just, it felt more like a van. It, you know, it was just un, a little unwieldy, a little clumsy, um, and you felt the weight all the time. Well, we had the SE, so we got a little sportiness uh, into there. But it does sit more like a van, to be honest. And which I kind of like, you know, you have that short hood and you sit really upright. But I do think for a lot of people, when you're already kind of working against like, hey, it's a minivan, don't think that's lame. Then you sit in it and you're like, well, I feel like I'm driving a van. It's, you know, it's it's definitely something that I think is an uphill battle for them. And they have a new Sienna that's supposed to come out in the next year or two, should be on the TNGA platform. And I assume it's going to be more competitive. But yeah, this thing's definitely, I, I don't think... I would want to get a Sienna at full price when there's a Pacifica or Odyssey out there. But, you know, if you can find a good deal on one, again, there's a lot of safety tech in them. It's a Toyota, so you know it'll last forever. Or, well, I don't know forever, but, you know, it'll last a while. It's the most powerful minivan in the segment. I don't know why you need nearly 300 horsepower in a minivan, but if that's something that's important to you, Hell yeah. there there you go. So it's it's not terrible at all, but it's definitely outclassed at this point. Well, and despite reports to the contrary that we hear every few years, the minivan segment is far from dead. Uh, you know, they're selling uh, over 100,000, you know, Pacificas a year. Same with Odyssey. They're probably doing sixty to 80,000 Siennas. Um, you know, the Kia Sedona doesn't sell that well, but it's a decent option. Um, you know, a lot of automakers abandoned this segment just, you know, <laughs> running for the hills. Uh and I don't really think it was because the segment was collapsing. I think it was they they were making terrible minivans and they didn't want to invest what it would take to make a good one and be competitive. Uh, so since they saw the, you know, kind of the a major shift to SUVs and then crossovers, they just decided to abandon minivans. But for those who stayed and those who put in the, the, the dollars um, to develop good products, Honda, Chrysler, uh, Toyota, they've made a killing on these things. Uh, and, you know, their starting prices are like low 30s, but nobody ever buys those. People buy the buy minivans loaded. So they're they're making a lot of money on, on every single one they sell. Uh, how much was the one that you drove? Do you remember? I want to say I can pull it up in one second, actually. I it bet was. it was high 40s. Oh, Easy. yeah. It was $45,630. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. It, but it's not. They're like luxury cars today. Uh, minivans. When you get a fully loaded minivan, it is the it is it is posh um, and super comfortable. To well, and point, also though, too, as minivan... much as I agree that like the ones that have put the money in, you know, like Chrysler and Honda or FCA, I should say. I'm still living in a world where Chrysler was its own entity, but FCA and Honda, which have really made great modern minivans, you got to give credit to Toyota and even Dodge that they stuck around, not necessarily having the best. The Dodge really being pretty awful, to be honest, but not necessarily having the best, but just being able to churn them out. And, you know, at this point, the Sienna is just printing money for Toyota. They've, you know, they've paid off everything that it costs to develop it, you know, in the factory. So they're they're just running away with money at this point. Good for them. Yeah. Okay, uh, Clint, what about you? What have you been driving? So not to outdo Greg in his minivan, but I can talk about what I drove this week, uh, and that was the new mid-cycle refresh 2020 Honda Civic Si. Uh, we spent a little bit of time with it on the road, but we actually had most of the day at Circuit of the Americas, which is an incredible experience. Um, that's a track, you know, three and a half miles just hosted the Formula One race as well. So it's known for you can take any supercar you'd like, high horsepower vehicles, and go crazy fast around the track. So Civic Si, you know, front wheel drive, 205 horsepower, 192 pound feet of torque. It doesn't immediately come to mind as the perfect vehicle for that track, um, but it was such a good experience because it is the perfect reminder that you can still take an approachable, not expensive car, go around a track and have a hell of a lot of fun in the process. That car is a car that's attainable to just about everybody. It starts at $25,000. Um, and it's a car that you should buy to start your love affair with performance driving. And I think that's what the Civic Si is is best. Well, what um, an experience, man. You drove, uh, a, like you said, a Civic Si, a tainable car, on the same track that held an F1 race like the week before. Yeah, it was the day before. We watched Jeez. the Formula One race on Sunday and then had to, we were able to drive the track on Monday. It was surreal. 
That's um, amazing. The only thing Honda did to modify those SIs for the track that day is they upgraded the brake pads to HPD Honda Performance Development brake pads, but you can also purchase those as well. So no extensive modification. We drove stock cars that are the same cars that are going to end up in the media fleet too. So absolute uh, street vehicle. And, you know, aside from the understeer that you would uh, uh, expect from a front-wheel drive car, it was fantastic. And that understeer is actually mitigated with the limited slip diff. It, does, it has a mechanical limited slip diff that's standard with the car, and it gets rid of a lot of that. Um, but it's just so easy to get in and drive. I am certainly not a r- race car driver. I'm the furthest thing from it. And even somebody who's novice like myself can take it around that track um, and be safe and have an amazing time. What kind of speeds were you getting up to? <laughs> so uh, we were lead follow on the straightaway, but you definitely hit, you know, over 100 miles per hour on the straight. You know, they kept things. We didn't have full reign of the track, <laughs> but which is a good thing. You Probably know. smart on their part. Yeah. And we were able to get it all the way, you know, uh, out of fourth gear into fifth on the straights. And, and because it's 200 horsepower, you can actually floor it and not be scared for your life as well. You can really maximize the car's potential, which is almost a rarity these days with cars being so high horsepower all the time to be able to fly and be flooring it for most of the track is is a really cool experience yeah that uh, that sounds uh amazing so yeah you uh you win for the week (laughs) it's no minivan but yeah yeah um all right so this this past week was a pretty momentous one for me as well when it comes to to driving cars uh and that's because after gosh for 15, 16 years of driving media vehicles, reviewing cars, getting a new car every week, I actually decided to um, stop that and stop uh, reviewing cars. And you may, that may sound totally weird for someone in my position um, to be working at Motor One and decide all of a sudden to stop reviewing cars, but there's a reason um, and it involves driving some other cars. Um, so the the reason that someone would ever choose to to give that up is for one like I said I've been doing it for so long um you know that that kind of that kind of specialness you think that might come with it had kind of worn off um it's actually very difficult to review cars every week you know it takes uh you know you have to do a full photo shoot with them and then you know writing the actual review and scoring them takes many many hours so I was giving up a lot of time and and, you know, I manage uh, a few websites here at our company and I was just running out of time to, to get everything done. Also, there's the fact that um, you guys are part of, you know, this great um, team of editors that reviews cars for us. And we actually have more reviews to publish than we know what to do with. Um, so, you know, my output wasn't that critical um, in terms of just, you know, Motor One having enough cars to review. But the real reason why I decided to um, stop doing this is because I found a car that I, it's one of the, one of the few cars that I've driven in the, in my 18 years of driving a car every week where I've said to myself, I want to drive this every week more than I want to drive a new different car every week. Um, and that's the, the Tesla model three that my wife and I got recently. And we had originally got it for her. Um, and you know, me being the car person, I just, I fell in love with it. Uh, and I wanted to drive it as much as possible, but of course I was getting these media vehicles every week and, and she was taking this to work. So, uh, because she loves me and she knows that I'm into cars more than her, we made a deal and we got her another car and she's going to let me drive the model three every day. Um, now the car we got her, um, she actually fell in love with the, the Tesla in a way too. She didn't want to get another gas vehicle. She wanted an electric car. Um, and I didn't want to spend tons of money. So we settled on getting her a 2016, uh, Chevy spark EV, uh, which is, you know, a tiny little electric car it doesn't have tons of range. Uh, it has a, a, a maximum range of 84 miles. Uh, but Chevy did put a lot of, um, really high tech battery uh, equipment in there. Um, so it's got good, uh, charging capability and charging speeds. Um, and, uh, you know, like people say with the Fiat 500, the electric version is by far, uh, more fun to drive than the, the regular gas version. And that's totally the case. So, um, so we just picked up the Spark EV in the past week and I've actually been driving it a little bit. Um, and, and so that's the car I've been driving this week. 
Uh, and I love it. It's the, it's the cutest little thing. Uh, it, like I said, we bought used, it's got 14,000 miles on it, but it feels brand new. Like it, you know, it hasn't been driven at all. Um, and it is just, it, it reminds me when people, they don't talk about minis, uh, feeling like go-karts as much anymore because they've grown in size and weight. But to me, it reminds me of that, that feeling of, of, um, describing something as being like a go-kart to drive. Um, so I love it. The only thing I hate about it is that Chevy, uh, and they do this, Chevy does this with, I think all of its EVs. It doesn't give you a range indicator that just says, this is how many miles you have left. It gives you this weird set of three numbers, what it thinks you have left, what you have left in the best of circumstances and what you have left in the worst of circumstances. So the problem is like they say 84 miles, but to date I've never seen it even right after I unplug it at 84 miles. It's usually at like, you know, low seventies because the, the maximum best circumstances range is at like 80 miles. So trying to figure out exactly how many miles you have left is a challenge. Um, and it's usually less than what you think it should be because you're never, of course, driving in the ideal conditions. Is it getting worse in the cold too? Well, it's just starting to get cold. As a matter of fact, as we're recording this, I'm watching snowfall for the first time in Cleveland where I am. Um, and yes, we, we are going to expect that the range will fall. Um, I was talking to the Inside EVs uh, team and they were telling me like worst case scenario, like it's literally zero degrees outside. Um, the range could fall as much as half, but that's worst case scenario. And if that happens, we have the Model 3 that she can take to work and I'll, I'll stick with the, the Spark EV. Um, but as far as we can tell, we, 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 we mapped her route for her daily work, um, um, route. And even on the day she drives the longest, it should be well within the, um, the sparks, 84 miles of range. Um, so we think this is going to work well. We are now a totally EV family. Um, and we have a long range EV and a short range EV EV. So we're going to give that a try. Um, and see how it works. They're both gleaming white, um, and they look great. And I'm actually I'm installing a dual charger in my garage this weekend so that they can both charge on the same 240 volt outlet. So, so it's pretty exciting. I'm excited about it, even though yeah, it sounds weird that I'm not going to be reviewing cars anymore. But it's as much as I'm excited about the, driving the Model Three every day as it is I'm excited about uh, having some of my weekends back, uh, because I won't have to be writing reviews on Sunday afternoons, uh, when I want to be watching the Browns lose. Uh, so, <laughs> so, and like I said, I couldn't do this without you guys doing such a great job reviewing cars, going on first drives and things like that. So, uh, I appreciate the team, uh, that we have here at motor one, you guys included, uh, for making this possible. Um, and I will, I will send you postcards from my, my Tesla model three. Uh, as a matter of fact, today's like the first day I've been left home alone with it. So I've got like five errands planned, uh, to go run after work today. Um, so that I can, I can have some fun driving it around. Does one of them include donuts in the snow? Uh, not enough snow on the ground to do that. And honestly, it's a, it's an all-wheel drive. Uh, it's a dual motor. I don't even know if I can do burnouts in it. Uh, but I will have to test that and see as soon I as I think we you get and some. an iPhone camera should find out. Yeah, we should. We should. Um, well, I'm sure uh, I will have uh, multiple inches of snow on the ground soon enough um, for me to try that out. Are you going to put winter tires on either the Tesla or the Chevy? No. And, and to be honest, I mean, I, I espouse winter tires to other people, uh, but I've never bought them for myself, mostly because in Cleveland, it's not like we live under like six months of snow at a time. It's usually like it snows, then it melts, it snows and it melts. And so half the time you're driving your winter tires on just bare road um, and, you know, running the, the tread down. Um, that said, you know, I'm all about my wife's safety. And since this is a smaller car, uh, that might not be a bad idea. Although I might wait until the first snow falls and go take it out myself and see how it is to drive. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Do you have, well, you were, you've been living in Miami, but you're in Chicago now. And when I was in Michigan, I put them on my three series I had, and it turned that car into a little tank. Like I cannot say how much fun it is to have winter tires on your car because it just plows through and 
Now, did you did you have a second set of wheels that you already had them mounted on, or did you just have the tires and you paid somebody to like remount them on the same wheels? I got aftermarket BBS wheels for this BMW that I put good summer tires on for the summer for like autocrossing, and so, even though I only did like one autocross because it's too early to wake up, but I had dreams. And then I the stock wheels that I had sitting in. I guess you could call it a garage. It was a little like outdoor area that was open. And, you know, Ann Arbor, Michigan is a pretty safe spot and nobody stole my stock wheels. So I had the winter tires put on those. And then I took the summer tires and BBS wheels off and put the stock wheels with the winter tires on. Mm, Okay. Okay. You know what automakers should do? And especially the ones that maybe don't offer all wheel drive, they should just like include a set, a second set of wheels with summer tires or sorry, a second set of wheels with winter tires uh, with the purchase of a car, or at least offered as like an option uh, that you can roll into the payment. Uh, because I think that's a huge barrier to getting, uh, you know, snow tires is that like, you got to figure out where am I going to store them? Uh, do I got to get another set of wheels? Are they going to look good? And all that stuff. It'd be cool if they just offered a second set ready to go. You just drove home, maybe even offer to store them and then put them on for you. Um, when you, you know, when winter comes around, I'd imagine a lot of the dealers do offer that when you go buy a car, but what they don't offer, which I see, we shouldn't be speaking about this live because this is a business idea. We should be going and buying a facility, small little facility and just say, we'll hold your winter wheels and tires for, you know, $5 a month for the, you know, entirety of winter. And you don't have to have them sitting in your garage. And well, that and we'll get we'll get like one lift and we'll just offer to um put them on the car for you because what does that take yeah Yeah. so whoever Uh, steals this idea idea from us now that it's out in the airwaves uh make sure you send my five percent check you know so i'll I'll give you my email address later or or, yeah gift card or something uh because that's a great idea um all right well that brings us to the end of our show uh you can follow greg on twitter at the finker uh clint simone at clint simone and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. I want to thank you two for being on this week's episode with me. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And thank all of you out there for listening. We'll see you next week.